Tonight's program was initiated by a concerned Rockbridge scientist, medical doctor Fred Feverad, who reminded Rack's <laughs> who reminded Rack's board of its opportunity and responsibility to bring um, to, to help educate our community to the important issues embedded within the global warming and climate change topic. With support in hand from RAC and our valued co-sponsor, Boxerwood Nature Center, there's a lot of folks here from tonight, the Washington and Lee Geology Department, and the campus chapter of the Citizens Climate Lobby, Fred has been able to go out and recruit a leading and trusted scientific talent from here in Virginia to present tonight's address titled Global Warming, Evidence and Origin. Dr. William Ruddeman began his journey within professional science and education some 47 years ago, first studying geology at Williams College, then marine geology at Columbia University. A seven-year stint with the U.S. Naval Oceanographic Office, finished as a senior scientist, proceeded 17 years at Columbia's Lamont Doherty Observatory, where he served as both an associate director and the senior research scientist while enjoying broad support from the National Science Foundation. Bill's institutional career was capped with an important decades work at the University of Virginia Department of Environmental Sciences, serving there as both departmental chair and now continuing as a professor emeritus from UVA. Along the way, Dr. Rutterman has published 137 articles in various scientific journals. There's pages and pages including Nature, Scientific American, and Science, and authored three books, including Earth's Climate. He wrote the textbook used by undergraduate uh, programs such as here at the Geology Department of Washington and Lee. Um, and the, the one that I enjoyed was Plows, Plagues, and Petroleum, which posits um, which posits the Ruddeman hypothesis on how humans took control of climate, published by the Princeton Press in 2005, 2007, I'm not sure which, available on Amazon. I read this book this last weekend, um, and I was um, frankly awed and grateful for its dense but accessible comprehensive explanation of science's growing understanding of the complex system we know as Earth's climate. Dr. Ruddeman's particular research into anthropogenic climate change mechanisms presents a full, fair, and balanced inquiry into humanity's past, present, and future roles within nature of Earth's climate. Bill with his family are lucky enough to reside on an elevated and shaded western spur of Pisgah Hill outside of Brownsburg for some 25 years, and he still enjoys an unspoiled view and no line of sight to the Dominion Towers. <laughs> I trust we will gain many insights from this hour's edification, so please join me in welcoming our speaker tonight, Dr. William <laughs> Ruderman. Thank you, Lee, and thanks to Fred for getting this all started. Um, I want to give you a bit of a feeling. Have those of you standing, there are still some seat, seats here and some chairs that could be moved around. We have four or five chairs down here. Um, this says what I'm going to talk about, global warming, the evidence and its origin. That's most of what I'm going to talk about. Uh, I have about 15 slides on the evidence. I have two on the origin, because there's really only two possibilities, so it's that simple, it doesn't take long. Um, and I have some slides that will tell you a bit about what might happen in the, in the state of Virginia uh, in the near future based on what's been happening just by a direct extrapolation and then I'll end with a slide that should disturb you. Uh, I'm, a, I'm a very um, cautious, uh, conservative, conservative in the old use of the word. 
um, scientist. I don't like to get out ahead of the evidence. I rely on the evidence. So wh what I and what I have to tell you is very representative of what the mainstream scientific community thinks the vast majority of the mainstream uh, scientific community. I don't work on modern global warming myself. Hope I can see which this ought to be it. I don't work on, mo on the modern uh, situation myself, so I'm not technically a climate scientist. I'm a paleoclimate scientist, which means I work on previous uh, climate uh, changes. Everything from 50 million years ago up to um, the last several thousand years. That's, that's the, uh, the Rudderman hypothesis that Lee mentioned, and that hypothesis is that farmers began 6,000 years ago, began to um, affect climate. They cut down trees to, to farm in areas that were forested, and they created rice paddies, which are like natural swamps or wetlands, but they emit, they emit methane, and they tended livestock, and, and livestock emit methane. So that's, that's my own work. However, because I've authored this textbook, three editions of it, this is from the cover of the second edition. It's my favorite because it shows everything from human dwellings to, you can't really see it, but there's some terraces on that very steep, steep uh, mountain in the, in the mid-range up to the, uh, the snow cover up high with wisp, wisps of snow blowing in the wind off the tops of the mountain. I love that, love that picture. So on to the evidence, As, and I think the talk will probably take about 30 minutes. I want to leave time for some, uh, for some um, questions and answers, and then we will have a, uh, a bright and forward-looking student from uh, Washington and Lee talk, talk some about uh, what we may do in the future. So just for perspective here, here's a plot of temperature in the vertical and years ago, shown in the horizontal, uh, where we were in a glac glacial world 20,000 years ago, ice sheets down to New York and uh, Chicago, Seattle, uh, and then it warmed up and it got pretty much as warm as it was gonna get by 8,000 years ago. We, humanity comes into the picture, we were in the Stone Age <clears throat> until about 5,000 years ago, then we got into the Bronze Age, then the Iron Age, and now we're in the Industrial Era, which is too thin to even show up on the plot, <coughs> except the temperature's begun to tur turn up, uh, as you all probably know. Here's a plot uh, from uh, NOAA, I think it is, of, uh, of global temperature over the interval that we have thermometers that can give us reliable records. So we go back to about 1880. The, the records back before 1900 have larger uncertainties. The uncertainties coming in towards the present are, are tiny, just tiny. And it's pretty obvious that Earth has been warming. Uh, I, the last data point or the last uh, bar on this is 2015, which is standing up rather alarmingly from what came before, but the whole trend, it has its ups and its downs, but the whole trend is up. Now, I want to point out something that's been uh, seized on by people who are skeptical about climate, and that's this peak right here, 1998. El that was an El Nino year, and El Nino years are always strong El Ninos are quite a bit warmer than the, the years that don't have El Ninos. So that, that year stuck up above the average. And then there were, for quite a while, the, uh, the trend did not 
much exceed that 1998 value. And so the, the climate skeptics began talking about the pause. Global warming has stopped or paused. Um, there were two years that were warmer than 1998, and they were not El Nino. Well, one was a weak El Nino, and the other one wasn't an El Nino. But the, the climate skeptics claimed this. You've, if you read about this, you've almost certainly heard this, that there was a pause in global warming. That's a very deceptive statement, because look, look at every year before that El Nino, and look at all the years afterwards. You're way down much lower temperatures. Then you get that El Nino spike. And here, almost every year, it, well, there's a plateau that's way above everything. There's a, there's a seat here, and there's actually one there. Oh, kind of a kiddie seat. Come on. <laughs> so that is, uh, that's a misleading argument. And 2015's blown that argument out of the sky. That's an El Nino year, and it's sticking up higher than what's around it. But look how much higher it sticks up than that El Nino year. And 2016 is off the charts so far. It's off the top of this scale. It'll, it'll go back down and not be as warm as this year and last year, probably in 2017. And they'll probably start talking about another pause in global warming. But you really only have to look at that plot and squint a little to say, you know, which way is it going, up or down? I think a fifth grader could answer that question. So part of the reason is things happen. Volcanoes explode and cool things off. El Ninos happen and warm things up. And the system just kind of sloshes around a little bit. It's not a straight march of temperature. So you have to kind of average over time. Well, here's a decade by decade plot up through 2001 to 2010. And it's going up. And 2000, uh, 10 to 2015 is again up somewhere <coughs> off, off the plot. So it's getting warmer. Now this is the surface of the earth, the, the land and the ocean surface. The people who have had uh, probably the most influence on the climate skeptics, uh, are, there are people that use satellite data uh, to, to measure global temperature or, or a proxy for global temperature. And it's a very complicated measurement. It's not, it's, you think, well, satellite technology, that's better than all these thermometers on the surface of the Earth. But it's much more complicated than that. The satellites are above our atmosphere. So to measure the atmosphere, and that's the troposphere, which is where the weather is, and we live at the bottom of it, and the stratosphere, which is way up higher, uh, the, the satellites measure everything that's coming back to the satellite from that whole layer. So to try and figure out what the troposphere, the, the warmer la layer that we live in, is doing, you have to subtract out the effect of the stratosphere. And that has been done, that and a few other things have been done incorrectly. So here's a plot from the two most famous uh, authors of, um, of uh, the satellite data showing what they think the decadal temperature trend has been doing since about 1970 or maybe 79 when the satellites started to, uh, to measure uh, this uh, proxy for global temperature. Well, at first, the sat they interpreted the satellite measurements to say Earth was cooling. So back when I wrote the first edition of my textbook, 2001, I presented the issue as a debate because there's a lot of things that said Earth was warming. The satellites said it was cooling. So that's so. Th and this so this is a plot of what's the change in temperature in degrees centigrade per decade. And they had it. They had Earth cooling, and that's 1999 or 1995, and by 1999, 2000, they still have it cooling, but it's not cooling as much. By the time it's 2001, 
Now they've got it warming because they're putting different corrections on their data. There were some national committees that met and evaluated how the satellite data was being handled, and they were members of the committee. And they basically conceded that uh, the satellite, their data had been miscorrected, so it was warming. And then it warmed some more, 2003, 2007, 2008. The uh, surface temperature data all along throughout this interval had said that the surface of the Earth was warming by an amount that would plot up about here. So they've been, they were wrong, at least through this data point, and I wouldn't be surprised if they get some more corrections and bump, bump it up to where it just about agrees with the sur surface temperature measurements. Now it doesn't have to agree with the surface temperature measurements because it's measuring, if it's done correctly, this whole uh, layer of the troposphere, which is which goes up uh, 15 miles or so, it's about half the thickness of the atmosphere. Whereas we live, the, the the temperature data, the thermometer data, is right at the surface. So those can be somewhat different. They should be similar, but they don't have to be identical. So here's a plot up to 2015, back to. 1979, probably, of uh, one of the well-respected reconstructions of surface temperature. That's shown in orange. That's, that's from Goddard Institute, uh, from NASA, but there's a reconstruction from NOAA and one from the British Meteorological Office and the Japanese Meteorological Office and a group at Berkeley, uh, University of California, Berkeley. And they all show virtually identical trends, these are the surface thermometer trends. In blue is the, the current version from that group that I just showed you with their, with their changing estimates. These two trends are remarkably similar. similar. It's getting warmer. The, satellite, the surface temperature thermometer data says it's getting a little warmer, a little faster than the other one, but uh, it, it's not a big difference. Here's that last El Nino, 1998. Uh, the surface temperature data has it uh, warming quite a bit. The, uh, the satellite data has it warming a lot. So that's one thing, but that's quite possible, uh, quite possibly a difference between what's happening with the whole thickness of the troposphere, <coughs> the lower atmosphere versus the surface. And here's where we are today, where we're in this, uh, uh, unprecedented uh, warmth of the current El Nino, which is really off the charts, literally. The, the heat that goes, that heats the, the, the heating of the surface of the land, the surface layer of the ocean is a tiny fraction of the total heating of the planet. Uh -oh. I'm not even touching it, but it <laughs> looks like it leans. Oh well. Um, so most of the heat, about 95%, goes into the ocean, and it gets as deep as uh, 2,000 meters. That's about half the thickness of the ocean. So here's a plot of the warming. Oh, no, the that's the storage of heat in units that I don't even remember what they stand for, but just take, just take the plot as uh, how much heat is in the ocean. It's been going up uh, pretty drastically for 45 years. Uh, and there's new kinds of measurements coming in uh, up at the top. And it's uh, the, o the ocean. This is the major reservoir of global warming, unquestionable trend towards warmer, a warmer world. This uh, complicated looking plot shows for that span of time to, up to this point and then projections. It shows the, the volume of ice in the Arctic sea ice. The sea ice is a thin cover over the Arctic Ocean. So uh, 
most of this number is the area of the ice, which is very large, uh, but it's multiplied by the thickness. We know that from uh, going all the way back to the Cold War when submarines from the U.S. were patrolling underneath the ice and, and measuring uh, the thickness of the sea ice above. Sea ice can be about three feet thick if it forms just the first year. If it stays around, it can get to be maybe 15 feet <coughs> thick. So it's a, it's a thin skim, and it's floating on the, on the ocean. Well, here are the trends for all, all of the months. And so in the summer, actually it's September, uh, you have the least ice. And in about this time of year, you have the most ice. And the trend for every month is <coughs> headed down and headed down in, uh, I guess it'd be fair to call it a worrisome way. It's, uh, in fact, this trend, which was cut off in 2010, looks, looks like it's gonna go to zero this year. There'll be no ice in September. However, you notice there's some bouncing around in the trends and it did bounce back up a little bit. <coughs> so it's not gonna go to zero this year, but it's not going to be too far in the future before September. The Arctic is all blue when once it was all white. That's a, that's a major change. We've repainted the surface of the uh, Arctic Ocean. The winter trend, well, all the other seasons, uh, seasons do the same, and the winter trend is doing it. In fact, we just set, uh, I don't have it plotted on this plot, but we just set a new record low ever this uh, this past month. So, and this, these curves that are fitted um, to these lines are not straight line trends. They're bending towards faster loss of ice. It's speeding up. Here's a plot, another kind of ice. I don't have these labeled properly, but I, hopefully I'm explaining them. This is the length of the major mountain glaciers of the world, it's a few hundred of them, um, relative to 1950 being zero. So they were all pretty extensive, or the vast majority were pretty extensive between 1700, 1850, uh, and then started to head, head down and have lost major amounts of, of, uh, of their lakes. There's not much heat used to melt the mountain glaciers, but the evidence is completely consistent that the planet is warming, and in this case has been since 1850, which if I remember to uh, make the point, uh, you'll see is significant. Here's another unlabeled slide. Uh, this is the volume in, um, it's, it's the mass, I should say, in billions of tons, uh, gigatons, that's a billion tons. Um, of the Greenland ice sheet since, since satellites became capable of measuring uh, the Greenland ice sheet, the size of it. They do that partly by measuring its gravitational attraction uh, to the satellite and partly by using radar to bounce sound uh, through the ice sheet to see what, let's see the thickness from the top to the bottom. And, Here's another unmistakable trend. It's only, what, in this plot, uh, eight, eight years old, but it's, it's continuing to, to do much the same uh, up, up to the present. It's the, and the, the variations are summer and winter. Summer, you melt some ice. Winter, you snow some of it back on. But the trend is we're losing uh, ice in the Greenland ice sheet. Now, the Greenland ice sheets, I forget the exact number, it's probably 1,500 meters, you know, 5,000 feet thick. It's a huge amount of ice, and that will become relevant. So remember this trend. Remember mainly the point that it's this curve fitting. You can evaluate whether you think it's accurate or not. This curve fitting shows a trend that's accelerating. We're losing more ice per year faster as you come towards the present. A little more complexity here. This is another plot of, uh, of um, the mass of ice sheets. The, 
the Greenland plot is shown, the one I just showed you without the annual variations is shown here. It's this trend that's headed downwards and headed downwards faster as you go through time. So that's Greenland. Now, Antarctica is shown here. It's losing mass, but not as fast. Antarctica plus Greenland, that's all the ice sheets, the two ice sheets in the world. The total is pretty much defined by Greenland. It's going down, it's going down faster with time. There's one exception in Antarctica, uh, East Antarctica, is, which is the big, the vast part of the Antarctic ice sheet. It's actually gained a little uh, mass, that green line that's going up a little bit. And the reason <coughs> is, is simple. Um, Greenland, uh, ice, Antarctica is so high, and it's right at the pole, that it's just bitterly cold. Uh, a, good, a good summer in Antarctica is like winter in Siberia. And it's a desert. And it's a desert because there's almost no moisture in the air that far south and that high. All the moisture has been wrung out of the air. So it, in the higher parts of <coughs> Antarctica, it basically doesn't really snow. It's, uh, some of you may have experienced it and not have been sure what you were seeing. But if, if you're ever in an area uh, on a day when it's really bitterly cold, you can be standing out in blue sky, and you'll see little ice crystals coming out of the air and settling slowly. Well, that's in Antarctica, that's a snow. Uh, if you get down around the ocean, you can get what we recognize as snow. There's about three inches of precipitation falls on East Antarctica. So if the climate warms a little bit, which it is over Antarctica, you get more moisture getting up to the top of the ice sheet, and so you get a little bit in, of an increase uh, in, in its volume or mass. Um, but combined with uh, the rest of Antarctica, Antarctica is <coughs> losing ice mass because it's losing so much down around the base of the ice sheet. And combined with Greenland, ice sheets are melting, and they're melting faster towards the present. Here's a measure of sea level for the last, uh, I guess, 30 some years. Sea, sea level, again, relative to some arbitrary zero baseline. Sea level is going up. There's some, there are some dips here and there. Looks like it may be accelerating, and there is data that says it is accelerating in the last 10 years. So. The water that's raising the level, the, the, the raising of the level of the ocean is due to three things. Uh, melting of the mountain glaciers has been sizable. Melting of the ice sheets has not yet been much of a factor. And the other factor is that the ocean getting warmer, which I showed you, water expands as it heats. And so all three of those things are, are, are moving uh, sea level up along our coasts. So everything I've show, shown you to this point says the planet is warming. Uh, there just isn't any uh, question about that. <coughs> now, there are two possible explanations that are seriously uh, worth considering. <clears throat> One is that the sun is changing its intensity. So maybe there's more heat or irradiance coming in from the sun. So here's, here's one plot of global average temperature going back to 1890. And you get that strong rise since about 1975 or 1980. This is a plot of solar irradiance. Um, and the yearly plot, the light blue plot, shows a very regular cycle. That's the 11-year solar cycle. Uh, it, it's a fact. The sun does vary on an 11-year cycle. But the, the heavy blue line um, is 
is the irradiance averaged over an 11 year uh, smoothing interval. And you, you see that during the time when the global warming trend has really taken off, the solar signal has decreased. That's, that's going in the wrong direction to explain this. It's either flat to be charitable or it's headed down, which is to my eye more accurate. So the sun is not the ca cause of global warming. Here is the cause. Uh, these blue data, no, notice this time scale now, we're going back 400,000 years. Notice this time scale of ice age cycles with CO2 concentrations ranging from about 180 parts per million to about 280 <coughs> parts per million. Now, how do we know that? Uh, if you drill an ice core, there are tiny little air bubbles trapped in the ice. and in a just amazing feat of technological skill, uh, geochemists have managed to measure these ancient, tiny, squished bubbles of air to measure the CO2 concentration. And, this, and the concentrations are in parts per million. And it sounds like something that you could, couldn't possibly do. But if you drill, drill two ice cores, you can compare between them, and they look, they look exactly the same, well, essentially exactly the same. So these, these are accurate, reliable measurements. So nature has its own CO2 cycles from 180 to 280 parts per day, um, for reasons I won't go into, and for reasons which are, to some extent, still being argued about. But starting around 1800 or 1850, that's, that's the time when the mountain glaciers started to uh, lose their length in that previous slide. CO2 has taken off, and it's now, in this plot, which I can tell must be 10 years old, here it's up to about 375 parts per million. Now it's just gone past 400 parts per million. So 280 is a natural maximum, 400 is our current maximum. Th these records actually go back 800,000 years, and it doesn't tell you anything different than these four cycles shown here. So that's the whole argument about the cause of global warming. It's not the sun. Carbon dioxide and in recent years, uh, uh, methane and uh, chlorofluorocarbons and some other things that we put in the atmosphere, that's, that's the reason. But CO2 is by far the main reason. Put that number in your memory. 97% of climate scientists, the people who work on this problem, agree that it is the planet's warming and that we are the main cause because of our carbon dioxide releases. So if you have the impression that there's a serious debate about this, you have some company. 55% of the public thinks that scientists are debating this. More than half the people think scientists aren't sure. 97% of scientists are quite sure. Now, something about that should strike you as wrong. <laughs> how, how could that possibly be? And I'm not uh, in the habit of getting into uh, politics and uh, related matters, but there is a disinf disinformation campaign that's explaining that as opposed to that, and it's coming out of energy conglomerates. You've probably heard of the Koch brothers. They're, they are uh, major, major villains. You probably, you may know that ExxonMobil is now under investigation by New York State and Massachusetts, and I think other states are going to join in because they knew, their scientists in 1980 knew that global warming was going to do something like it's doing now. And they, instead of announcing that and taking actions to do something about it, 
They stifled their scientists who knew the truth, and they began a disinformation campaign uh, to convince the American people that scientists didn't know really what was going on. It wasn't a settled, it wasn't a settled issue. Now, for some reason, my car has been unable to go into an Exxon station ever, <laughs> ever since. I, I'm not one of those boycott kind of peop, people, but I just do not. Even though I'm probably penalizing some poor guy that owns the station and not Exxon, uh, that's the only reasonable cause, the explanation for why the American people are so misinformed. I mean, there, there are some subsidiary things that I won't get into, which get more political. But it's it's a case of follow the money. Now, to give you a feeling of. What the future holds, uh, there, there is some uncertainty in how warm it's going to get, but if you just do straight line projections uh, of trends that are already underway, um, there's some trends I would call worrisome. This is one, this is a little complicated to get hold of at first, but these are maps that show areas where for the year as a whole, 1955, 65, 2010, 2011, it's unusually cold, shown in blue, or unusually warm, shown in orange and, and then red. Um, and these maps, the standard baseline for these maps is in the 50s and 60s. So you get something, you know, reasonably comparable amounts of uh, blue and orange because that's the baseline that's defining what average is. I show two years out of two recent years out of many, and that that world is noticeably redder. It's not only red; it's I'm not even sure if that's red or black or purple. It's burnt. It's burnt. <laughs> yeah, burnt. That's good. Uh, you can see at a glance that the unusually warm years are getting more frequent. They're covering a larger area, and they're. The, their, uh, so the world's, the world's heating up, and this, this is kind of like, if you want to think about heat waves, uh, heat waves which could uh, lead to <clears throat> miserable summers like we had three and four years ago, but not the last two years. The last two summers here were wonderful, I thought. Um, we're going to have more of those not so wonderful years, and when it gets really hot, it gets dry. Uh, the, the, heat pulls uh, moisture out of the ground, and so the ground gets dry. And then when the ground gets dry, it gets even hotter because there's no moisture in the ground to kind of hold back the heating. So what this slide basically says is that heat waves and droughts are coming to a place near you. They won't stay every year. They won't be there every year. Because if you look at these maps, the, uh, the areas that are, in this case, slightly warmer than normal, uh, move around. They move around because there's noise in the climate system. So you have to think about a trend that's bouncing around but heading persistently in one direction. So like Texas had brutal <coughs> heat waves and droughts, uh, I think about two, three years ago. It's been kind of wet in Texas lately and, and, not, and not hot. Um, so they don't stay forever, but they're, they're be, they'll become more frequent, they'll last longer, and they'll be, they'll be much more severe. So that's what we have in store, even in a place like Rockbridge, which is uh, isolated from a lot of the worst effects that global warming can have. Here's a plot of something called, I couldn't find one for Norfolk. I'm, it's probably out there, but I couldn't find one. Atlantic City is close enough. This is a plot of nuisance, what's called nuisance floods. And these are floods that are bad enough to fill the streets with water in the lower lying areas of the city, uh, of the towns or beachfront towns. Um, maybe get up on your lawn a little bit. Make, make you have to wear boots or flip-flops, uh, make you have to drive your car with the water up, up well up on, on the wheels. Um, and you notice 
there's like a handful of nuisance flooding days back in the 20s, 40s, and 60s, but something starts to happen. And there's still a lot of year-to-year -year noise. That's that noisiness in the climate system. But we're now up at, we're closing in on one nuisance flood per year, uh, per week in Atlantic City. Uh, people in Miami, you may have read about, they have this too. Uh, parts of Norfolk, uh, they have it too. And reasonable projections of this curve get you to where you're going to have a nuisance flood about every other day in these beachfront towns. Um, it's, this is not a catastrophe, but it sure as heck is a nuisance. Now, here's where uh, we get to the really disturbing part of the, uh, of the, of the talk. And this is very recent, this, uh, this kind of information. Well, this slide isn't recent. The, the basic layout of the slide's been known for a long time. But the implications have just, have just uh, begun to be appreciated literally in the last three years. This is uh, supposed to portray the Antarctic ice sheet. It could be Greenland, uh, where there's, there's this huge, tall ice sheet thousands and thousands of feet thick of ice in the interior. Um, and there are ice streams, it, so it's, you get that snow, that little crystalline snow, or, or maybe at lower elevations, a real, a real snow. And that, that feeds the ice sheet. The ice streams down through features that are somewhat analogous to, analogous to rivers on the landscape. That's why the word stream. And the ice streams come down to the coast. Now, out here is the ocean. Out here is the sea ice, which I told you is very thin. Uh, in, in fact, around Antarctica, it's all first year ice, so it's three or four feet thick. Um, but between the ice stream coming out and the sea ice, are ice shelves, which are hundreds of meters, not thousands of meters thick, but hundreds of meters. And um, they flow towards the, towards the ocean. And they're the things that create these huge icebergs that you see photographs of. Well, these ice shelves are grounded on bedrock ridges, which are sometimes called pinning points. Um, and the reason they're called pinning points is they they slow the flow of the ice that's, that's come out into this ice shelf. They're, they're, there's a frictional component. You know, the, the ice is scraping across the rock. It can't move freely, so the friction slows it down. And these have been known for a long time. But what's, what's come about very recently, particularly because there are vehicles that can, remotely operated vehicles that can go underneath these ice shelves, is that well, the ice shelf fronts in several ma of these major regions have retreated to where they're sitting right over the bedrock ridge. They're not out here in front. They're on top of the bedrock ridge. And at the rate things are going, and there's no reason to think they won't continue to go the same way because the ocean is warm. It's warm enough to, the ocean, even though it's near freezing, it's warm enough to melt the ice, melt this ice. So this melting is going to go on. These ice shelves are going to clear these bedrock ridges. And you notice, as you go back down into the interior, you can think of these as valleys. It's not the whole ice sheet doesn't slope down like that, but large portions do. So what's going to happen is these ice shelves are going to get back to here, and then they're going to lose that frictional component that's stopping them from flowing. They're going to speed up, and speed up probably a lot. Now, the, the real awareness of this has only come in the last three years, and there are a lot of complexities uh, about we're not sure, people aren't exactly sure about the topography back here farther in. And um, uh, so how free these ice shelves are going to be to, to flow out into the ocean uh, is still under debate. 
I told you earlier, if you melt, I think I did, if you melt sea ice, you don't change sea level because it's already floating in the ocean. But if you melt this stuff that's coming out, that, that does change sea level. And I told you that Antarctica and Greenland have been minor contributors to sea level rise so far. They are pretty soon going to be major, major uh, contributors. So there's a, a real reassessment coming out of this, basically this slide. It, and to put it in perspective, <clears throat> the last government report, intergovernmental panel report, said that by 2100, sea level would rise, I think they said something like uh, two meters, uh, six, that would be six feet. Um, no, no, uh, three quarters of a meter, which would be like two feet. Uh, now that's, that's small enough not to be alarming, but large enough to be annoying <laughs> if, you, if you don't like water in your front yard in Virginia Beach. Uh, it's every day it's going to be it's going to be annoying but that was a and that estimate has been widely con criticized by climate scientists as being too cautious it's all it's way too far on the low side there are a whole host of estimates out there now depending on what studies are finding out about this situation but I think from from my reading, I, I could quote you all kinds of numbers, but from my reading, I would say two meters, that's six feet of sea level rise by 2100 is now uh, going to occur, is, is, the, is a good predict, prediction. And there are some people say it could be six meters, 20 feet. And one very distinguished Scientists. In fact, the guy who's led the community's awareness of global warming ever since 19, the 1980s, he's one of the uh, 20 feet uh, estimate types. Now, you remember that Greenland ice sheet trend is speeding up? So it's, it's losing volume faster as you come towards the present. It's only 10 years of record. It's not enough to be really sure. But he says, that speed up is going to itself is going to speed up, and it's going to get twice as fast every 15 or 20 years. The amount of ice lost by by these ice sheets. So to put that in perspective, we go to uh, Bethany Beach, um, Delaware, halfway between Rehoboth and Ocean City. There's no place in Bethany Beach that's higher than four and a half feet above sea level. So six feet is not going to be good news for uh, Bethany Beach or Rehoboth or Ocean City, anything well over six feet is going to be really bad news for all the barrier islands on the East Coast and U.S. Gulf Coast. So think of Long Island has barrier islands. New Jersey is all barrier islands. The, the strips of sand with a bay in the back and then the mainland behind. All of New Jersey is like that. All of the Delaware coast is like that. Uh, all of the Maryland coast is like that. All of the Virginia Delmarva coast is like that. All of North Carolina pretty much is like that. I think there's some gaps in South Carolina. A lot of Florida is like that, et cetera, et cetera, all the way. So we're looking at a world, and again, I'm careful. I'm a conservative. Uh, I don't like to get out in front of the data. We're looking at, world, at a world where all the barrier islands around this eastern coast and gulf coast are underwater by, uh, by 2100. And it's not just the ocean coming up, you know, right now we're holding it off by scraping up sand, dredging up sand and piling it along the beachfronts, including at Bethany. Um, it's not just the beachfronts, though. There are inlets into these bays, extensive bays that are behind these barrier islands. So the water's going to come from the beach side, and it's going to come from the, the back bay side. So barrier islands, it's hard to see how we will have barrier islands left uh, by 2100. Um, we have major seaports. Uh, 
all, coastal cities all around the east, Gulf, and west coast. Their uh, lower areas are going to be subject to uh, flooding and presumably abandonment. I, you can build walls, but at some point it just gets uh, prohibitively expensive. At some point it makes more sense to, uh, to retreat. Now some cities have, parts of some cities are quite high in elevation. Um, so not, it's not a prescription for a universal disaster. My last comment though is these retreats, once the mostly Antarctic ice sheet gets past these pinning points, scientists, very reliable scientists have used the word unstoppable, unavoidable. So what I just described with somewhere between six and 20 feet of sea level rise by 2100 is, uh, is somewhere in that range. So six feet is probably unavoidable, unstoppable. 20 feet, maybe too much, maybe on the high side. So you have to qualify that a little bit. But that has changed my attitude. I, I always, acknowledge, I've acknowledged that global warming is happening, that it's major. And it, I, I tend to use the word worrisome, but I don't like to get into alarmism and I don't like to get into politics. So I, I have stopped at alarmism, but this is getting somewhere beyond alarming. If, if, it, if it really is unstoppable, unavoidable, um, the world needs to, oh, forgot, I knew something was missing. There's uh, uh, the Hampton area, uh, Norfolk, Virginia Beach, everything that's colored is less than 10 feet above high tide. So all of, that's much of Norfolk, parts of Virginia Beach, there's some barrier islands coming down here, yeah, Gloucester. Um, that's, that's all in imminent danger. And there's people meet, uh, at VMI tomorrow that, will, that are meeting to talk about what do we do about two feet of sea level rise or one feet or one foot or three feet. Mm -hmm. It's, if they have a long-term planning, it should think about something in the range of 6 to 20. So this, is, this has become very serious stuff. And I think it'll probably take four or five years for the science to hash out exactly what's going on in those ice streams and to come to a consensus about, about how bad it's going to be. But it is way worse than I would have ever thought. So I leave you with one message. <laughs> Time to wake up and smell the coffee. So, I've probably driven you into terminal depression, but that's them are the facts. So, what else can I do? I'm happy happy to take questions. <laughs>